Since it's 6.02, um, we'll just go ahead and get started and we will uh, let anyone who joins us late to just come on into the discussion. So with that, thank you everyone for joining for our second Water Roundtable discussion. Um, we have tonight a special guest that will be speaking as a panelist. You're welcome to engage with her, ask her questions, whether you're in person with us here or you're on Zoom, you can use the chat feature or you can always um, unmute and talk to her directly if you would like. So um, with that, I will let our presenter talk, but before I say that, we also wanna make sure that our um, CSU disclaimer is known for any of you that are here live with us tonight or you're watching this recorded session, is that um, any of our programs here with CSU Extension are available to everyone without any need of discrimination. So um, everyone is welcome to join all of our programs at any time. So with that, Ali, I'll hand it over to you and you're welcome to kick us off and do a little introduction and then we will roll into the rest of our program. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Ali Shook. I am currently serving as the interim executive director for the Fountain Creek Watershed District. And I am so sorry, it's the witching hour. My cat just loves to be on Zoom sometimes. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, and I am re I'm wrapping up my position as the Arkansas Basin Roundtable's uh, public education participation outreach chair. Um, so it's been a uh, about a year and a half that I've been working with Pepo, but um, I've just got too much of a workload and can't do it all. So I'm going to be wearing my, my Fountain Creek watershed hat, but um, we're all in this watershed together. So I hope that you'll find some of my um, presentation to be applicable to what you're doing. And this will just kind of be a, a watershed 101 um, type presentation with a little bit more detail on what the heck this watershed district is. So um, was that, is that good, Beth? Do you, do you wanna go around the room and say who's here or? I will go I... ahead and do that real quick. Just give um, our attendees a little bit of an opportunity to introduce themselves. They're kind of, if they have any part of water besides maybe using it in their house, in their backyard, and then uh, we'll roll into who we are and then we'll hand it back over to you. So we'll start We'll start with our one in person. So if you wanna introduce yourself for, the, for those watching. Yeah, I'm TJ Connect, a grower with Low Presti Farms in Vineland. Nice. And then do you have senior or junior water rights? Uh, senior. Perfect. Thank you. And then we'll go with Paul. If you want to unmute, uh, you're welcome to. Yes, ma'am. Uh, hi, I'm Paul Fanning, and I serve as the legislative appointee to the Arkansas Basin Roundtable and the liaison for the Public Education Participation and Outreach uh, Committee Working Group. Uh, so I've gotten to work with Allie, I've been very happy to work with her, very sad to see her leave that position, but understand very well uh, what, what she's dealing with. And she has really helped us uh, up our game as far as public outreach and education for water in the basin is concerned. A couple of other side issues is I also sit on the board of directors for the Water Education Colorado group and uh, still a member of Colorado Water Congress. And even though I've been retired from Pueblo Water for a couple of years, I'm still playing in the water, splashing around in here. So thank you very much for having this series of uh, roundtable conversations. It's, you know, all water conversations, I think are valuable conversations. So thanks for doing this. And then uh, Daniel, if you'd like to unmute, you're welcome to. Uh, I couldn't, my cursor disappeared. <clears throat> I'm Daniel Tucker. I'm the water resources engineer for the Arkansas Groundwater and Reservoir Association located in Fowler, Colorado. Perfect. Thank you. And then, of course, um, I'm Beth Filler. I'm the Ag and Natural Resource Coordinator for Pueblo County through the Extension Office. And I'm Christy Bartolo. I'm the agronomy agent for the Pueblo County Extension Office. So that's, that's who we have on tonight. Um, so with that, um, thank you all again for being here. And with, I'll give it back to you, Allie, and you are more than welcome to start your presentation for this evening. Okay, that sounds great. I'm gonna push the scary share screen button and hope something happens. Are you able to see my shared screen? We are. Great, so let's go to presentation mode. Can you see it advance? 
Yep. Okay. Great. Um, well, just a, a little quick background on me. I'm a water person. I was born and raised in Minnesota, don't you know, uh, land of 10,000 lakes. I'm a scuba diver whenever I'm able to get on a plane and there are pandemics. I'm an avid gardener in my backyard. That's our uh, 110 head of garlic that we raised last year. Um, love nature and animals and bird watching. And I've been getting into a little bit of ice fishing these past couple of winters. So um, water is my, my world, my life. I'm very... Um, i um, fortunate that I get to live my passion through the work that I get to do. So we'll just kind of go over a little bit of Watershed 101, talk about the numerous issues that we have and ways we can all help. So uh, the Fountain Creek Watershed Flood Control and Greenway District, that's the full name um, of this special district, we were established in 2009 um, to basically protect and enhance the health of, the home, of our home watershed. And really, we see a, you know, strong, resilient to sustainable ecosystem for all of those water uses that we so enjoy. So that's kind of what our vision is for our home watershed. And if you aren't familiar with that term, let's go back to fourth grade. So a watershed is an area of land and water that drains to a common water body. And we all live in a watershed. A watershed is like those Russian nesting dolls where there's a little one that fits into a bigger one and a bigger one. And it's all based on topography. So if you look at that picture, you see those yellow dotted lines. Those are the ridge lines. And we know that water only flows one way and that's downhill. Um, so watersheds are defined by the topography of the land around it. And our home watershed here, we like to call it the chicken tender kind of because it kind of looks like one. Uh, Fountain Creek watershed is 927 square miles of land and water. We have um, fully El Paso and uh, and Pueblo counties, but a little bit of Teller County. That's actually where Fountain Creek starts is behind the Walmart up there in Woodland Park. Uh, we have a huge elevation change from the top of Pikes Peak all the way down to the plains of Pueblo there. Um, quite a geographic uh, decrease. And then all of these natural conditions, including steep slopes, erosion, uh, tendence, a tendency to erode our soils. We have very strange and varied precipitation events, uh, all those water uses we talked about, and, and all these wonderful ecosystems. Um, and for that reason, we're the second most studied watershed in the U.S. The first is a canal in Florida, um, but we have a lot of gauges and people poking around and wondering, um, you know, how to better understand this, this little watershed that we live in. <clears throat> and as I mentioned, watersheds are part of larger watersheds. So, <coughs> excuse me, our home watershed is also the part of the largest watershed in the United States. That's the Mississippi, Missouri drainage basin, which is another word for watershed. And if you follow the path from Fountain Creek down to Pueblo through the Arkansas River. There's about 200 communities that utilize that same water that travels in our backyard uh, all the way until it gets down to the Gulf of Mexico. So we have a big responsibility, not only to us, you know, downstream doesn't just stop at Pueblo, but it's everyone else downstream from there till the ocean. I like to bring this one up, especially with um, folks that are new to the area. This is an image of none other than Colorado Springs. Looks a little dry, looks a little desolate, right? This was in 1875. This Helen Hunt Jackson was uh, describing the bleak, bare, unrelieved, desolate plain. Um, so it was very, very much like that back in those times. So you can see we've got the start of Colorado Springs. Of course, the river, the water is what brought people to this area. Uh, known to be um, sort of a healing place with all of our beautiful natural resources. Here's downtown Colorado Springs and Colorado College. And this is kind of what things look like today. So we've seen an extreme uh, change and adaptation to our natural landscape. And in order to have all of those changes, it's important to know that we didn't live on we don't live on a river in Colorado Springs particularly um, we have to import that water most of it 80 percent of that comes from a hundred miles away on the other side of the continental divide so these are all mountains um, in this image here and then the red lines are the pipelines where we bring that water through a series of tunnels 
And the newest uh, water delivery system is that Southern delivery system coming from Pueblo to Colorado Springs. So this really forward thinking, amazing engineering feats, that's what's allowed us to grow to the size of the community that we are. Otherwise we would not be able to survive on um, what was once um, an intermittent creek uh, being Fountain Creek. And now due to return flows and other things, we have a permanent water source, although uh, not that much CFS unless it rains a bunch. So what happens when we uh, look at our landscape and change it? If you look at the upper left picture here, we've got a natural environment. So we have trees and vegetation and about 50% of what falls on the ground is going to soak in or infiltrate. But as we begin to add those hard those parking lots, those streets and driveways and shopping malls, well, we see a much greater runoff uh, amount versus what can actually infiltrate. And that's what we see happening now on our lands. And I'll describe that a little bit more here in the next couple slides. So this is what stormwater is. Stormwater can either soak into the ground if it's permeable or if it's on an impermeable surface, it's going to run off. And what's the problem with that? Well, oftentimes there's stuff in that water besides water because water is collecting things as it's moving across the land. These storm drains here is a common site are clogged with litter. Uh, I, sometimes I see my you know, raccoons in my storm drain, but frequently I will also see litter. Uh, these drains are directly connected to our creeks, so there's no treatment that happens with the water that goes into those storm drains. Uh, as a result, we've got these huge gyres or huge patches of garbage in our oceans that are just circulating and breaking down plastics becoming microplastics, um, really big issues. Some of the, the size of those uh, gyres, one is the size of the state of Texas. So that much of a land mass, but in the ocean and just floating, you know, a lot of it's nets, a lot of it's plastic, uh, but all sorts of debris ends up there. And this is what we kind of see here locally when we really develop the land without properly caring for how that water is managed afterwards, we see a big uptake in um, and the erosion uh, and sedimentation that happens to the water. So this is a called Monument Branch. So it's a little tributary that comes into Monument Creek, a little bit north of downtown Colorado Springs. Behind these trees, uh, an apartment, uh, apartment complex went up and there really was little um, attention paid to the management of the water once those impervious surfaces were put in. And here, just a couple of years later, this whole little baby creek has been blown out. You can see it's choked with the sediment that came downstream with water. You can see the vegetation is gone. This is probably a half a million to a million dollar project just to restore that little creek. And you know, I'm sure you've seen examples of this in your communities as things are continuing to change and, and develop. So we get this, you know, this is a 50 foot wall. Uh, we call this, this is down by Frost Ranch, uh, south of Fountain. So this is just, you know, 80 feet of productive farmland is being lost as a result of, you know, unmitigated creek uh, maintenance. We have the sedimentation. So the water brings that, that sediment down and then it drops it out when that water slows down, causing large problems. You know, some other things that we are dealing with, as many communities are, we've got old infrastructure. This, a lot of these pipes, fortunately, not a lot of lead in our communities here, but we've got old infrastructure. We see, you know, pipelines will break here and there. We do have these flashy creeks that are known to be um, very dangerous. When we have a, a water, a rain event upstream, that wall of water can come down without even a warning. Um, we have water quality issues with some things such as E. coli, or selenium that are in our water and then the quantity of water how are we going to continue to provide water for our growing communities and then of course it you know we can't can't not talk about fires um we're still seeing them popping up hopefully nothing catastrophic but we did experience two catastrophic wildfires up in our region here not too long ago and um you know those forests won't come back to what they once were in in my lifetime so you know these are really devastating changes on the land 
I pulled this up today. I was curious what our drought prospects are. And fortunately, last weekend, um, although a lot of gardeners were quite sad and uh, scurrying around with blankets and such for their plants, but that uh, moisture really did help. Although you can see there are some places that we still have, you know, that extreme and exceptional drought. So this is something that uh, you can just pull up, just pull up the Colorado Drought Monitor, and it provides you with that daily update just to kind of see how things are looking and can really change dramatically within a couple weeks time. So, you know, these are a lot of kind of big, heavy topics. I mean, we, you can't go a day anymore without hearing about a drought, a flood, a fire, you know, some sort of water issue. Well, there are little things that can be done. Um, one is, this is kind of one of our signature programs is Scoop the Poop. You know, we've got a very dog friendly community uh, in our watershed here. A lot of folks with their dogs out there. And so we're just reminding people that it is your duty to scoop that poop up. It's not pleasant to smell it out there or to step in it and it does contain harmful E. coli bacteria that can make your pet as well as yourself sick. Uh, and in these, this uh, upper left hand <clears throat> uh, picture, those are flags. We thought, how much is out there? So we went to an open space and within 20 minutes, we had 200 flags of poo that we had identified in a public open space with trash cans right in the parking lot. Uh, but this is still being left out on the land. So that's something that we like to remind people that's their job to do. Um, lots of other water conservation things. I think conservation is kind of one of those spectrums where we're not always perfect at it all the time, but there's always just a little bit more that we can do, you know, so taking those quick showers, you know, checking your irrigation. Now, if you've got your you know, your garden hose set up, make sure you're not watering the law or the, uh, the street or the sidewalk. If there's any way that you can reduce the amount of bluegrass, that very water thirsty Kentucky bluegrass has no uh, real value in our in our uh, arid high desert environment here. There's a lot of great fescues, natural or native grasses that can be substituted if you needed some sort of a, a lawn. Um, getting a rain barrel, we're going to be talking about that a little bit later, but they used to be illegal. Uh, the headline was, uh, you won't believe what Colorado has legalized now. And they weren't referring to some of the 420 shops, they were referring to rain barrels. <laughs> that we were one of the last states to make that legal. Um, fixing any leaks. When I turned on my sprinkler system this a uh, couple weeks ago, I noticed that it just had the smallest drip, but boy, I didn't want to have any drips. So I had to call the plumber and get him out. Um, testing your toilet. That's an easy one to do too. You just take off the, the back of the toilet and you put about three drops of food coloring in, let it sit for 15 minutes and then open up the throne part or where we sit. And if there's color in that bowl, you've got a leaking, uh, probably a leaking flapper, which is about a $6 fix from the hardware store and those that is the number one sneaky leaker is your toilet so if you haven't performed that test that'd be a good one to try out uh of course running our machines our dishwasher washing machines when full and then you know if you want to wash your car it's actually better to take it to a commercial car wash so that water gets recycled multiple times uh, before heading to the wastewater treatment facility versus all of that running down your sidewalk uh, and of course, litter removal, I would be remiss if I wouldn't mention uh, Creek Week. This is the largest cleanup effort in the state of Colorado, and we want to keep making it bigger. So we want all of you to think about, um, it's a very easy program to participate in. We had 426% growth in that program uh, since we started it a couple years we're off because of covid but it's an easy fun thing to do and uh, fountain creek watershed district this is kind of one of our signature programs and the reason why is because we've got a couple of generations of folks that aren't familiar with this crying Indian. Um, maybe didn't see the commercial as he's canoeing around this lake and there's just garbage filled. Um, we, there's not really been that big mass media campaign about litter for years. Um, we've got so many children that grow up you know, in front of their screens and they're maybe fearful of what's outside in nature versus wanting to care for it. Um, so getting those youth started at that early age of appreciating, you know, nature and knowing that it is up to them and that they can do something good. Um, so cleanups are really fun and easy. And um, this is a nine day program. So we like to say nine days, no excuses. Uh, save the date, September 24th through October 10th this year. Those are our dates. 
And um, we usually participate beyond Fountain Creek. Trinidad, for example, um, part of the Arkansas Basin, they have been participating in the last several years. We're looking at um, involving Canyon City this year too. So, um, and I know Pueblo has had several cleanups. So this is something that we'll be working on over the next several months as we're gearing up for that. And just to show you our numbers, only 126 tons uh, we've removed over the last eight years. Pretty impressive efforts just to see, um, you know, again, it's fun, it's easy. We provide the tools to make it a, a safe and fun event and uh, something that we're really proud of. Uh, another program that you might not be familiar with is our Brew Shed Alliance. Um, there is this connection between clean water and great beer. And so that's what this program is all about. Uh, we have 25 breweries from Monument down to Pueblo, <coughs> excuse me, that have signed up and said, we get it. We know we need clean water to provide great beer. And so they'll do fundraisers. They'll do cleanups with us. Uh, this past Wednesday, Beth was a presenter at our liquid lecture that was held at Brews Ale House. Uh, so we do a monthly series or monthly-ish, uh, depending on speaker availability. But those are ways that we can continue to engage our community in a pretty casual manner over a beer. We can talk about these big, uh, terrible issues that we're all facing. Um, so just, you know, you all know this, that water is, is powerful, but it's also magical and it's scarce and it protects and supports everything we physically need and do. Um, and if you haven't read the book, The Blue Mind, um, I highly suggest, I don't recommend a lot of books, but that is one that um, really spoke to me in that whenever you're in or around or even just thinking about water, it's calming, it's soothing. So we say that we're in our blue mind when we're in those moments. So um, I know I talk really fast. I get excited and passionate, uh, but just thank you for your time of uh, this evening and be happy to answer any questions you might have about um, what we do or how we can partner because the way we found the best way to get things done is to work with others and, and collaborate. So uh, wel welcome and invite those opportunities. Hi, this is Paul. I, I, I think it bears mentioning, uh, Allie, that Creek Week does not require you to work nine days in a row to participate. Oh. It lasts for nine days. It's not a nine day commitment, is it? No, it, most of our cleanups are two hours long. You pick a date, you pick a time and you pick a location and you pick it up. So whether you're, you know, oh, my kid has soccer practice on Wednesday nights. That's OK. Go on the weekend. Well, we got a tournament on the weekend. OK, figure it out to go Monday morning before, you know, camp or whatever it is. So we yeah, like to offer up that nine day time frame to take away the barrier of time, weather, conflicts, et cetera. Hi, this is Dan Tucker. Um, I've got a question for you about um, the district's Fountain Creek projects. Um, I've got some practical experience um, working on channel restoration projects on Fountain Creek, Monument Branch Phase 3 being one of them, actually. Um, Monument Branch, um, the project that the district did at Pinion under the new Pinion Bridge a couple of years ago, but mm -hmm. um, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm curious where that project list stands now. Um, you know, when I was there, uh, when I was working on those projects, Larry Small was the director. And so there's been a little bit of turnover and I'm just kind of curious what the state of those projects is right now and where things stand and, and what's currently underway between uh, Colorado Springs and Pueblo. Sure. that's. That's a great question. Yeah, Larry Small retired about two and a half years ago. Um, Bill Banks, who was a former USGS hydrologist, he took over for Larry and then I just assumed in January. Um, so it's still interim. We're going through a strategic planning process this summer and then the board will be working on um, hiring that permanently. So um, we still have capital improvement plans. Uh, so there's some that the projects things happen, they take longer than you think, the different things happen. So we still have a list of projects that uh, we're working on, some from 21, some current from 22. So um, currently we're working on a Greenway master plan. So that is connecting City of Fountain and South as part of the Front Range Trail. 
Uh, we're going to be doing some outreach with the Fountain community this summer to see what they want along the M. Christian Ranch property specifically. Um, you know, what kind of amenities are they interested in? Uh, we're also look, looking at doing an E. coli demonstration project related to some of the horse stables on Fountain Creek. And our issue there is finding some willing landowners uh, that would let us on their property and that are interested in um, kind of being part of the solution. So that's underway. Uh, the Pueblo Levy project, we have a phase one and phase two. So phase one is completed. Um, phase two is the removal of those buttresses. It's kind of at the very end of the creek. That's the, really the last choke point along Fountain Creek. So um, you're talking about the old, uh, the old railroad bridge abutments. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Um, and so that is railroad owned property and that is the sticking point there. So that's been quite a challenge. Um, it's a hot potato in terms of the railroad would like someone to purchase that land in order for us to access it, but nobody wants to buy the land because it's got some environmental concerns. So um, we're in the middle of that one. Um, we're also in the middle of Eagle Ridge. That is a project uh, south of the Highway 47 project that will kind of connect all of the, the work that's been done there. We're doing a 30, Matrix is doing a 30% design on some of the various identified aspects in that one. Um, possibly some Frost Ranch wetland enhancements. Uh, I'm going to go out and visit with Jay next week on that. And then <clears throat> we're waiting to hear back on a grant from uh on South War Drive in Fountain. That's the one that's literally crumbling into the creek. Uh, so that's pretty high priority. We're waiting on to hear back from a grant. So, um, you know, and one thing that we've been discussing too is should, should the district get into the business of owning land? Should the district be looking at mitigation banking? or fees in lieu of services, those kinds of big questions. Um, <clears throat> and so we're wrestling with some of that and we're looking at potentially doing a mill levy in 2024 because we don't have sustainable funding. We pass a hat to all of our jurisdictional partners and that's a way we've been able to get, I mean, $31 million in project work done since really 2011, um, coupled with grants, coupled with additional dollars here and there from CDOT or other partners. Uh, but really, you know, we need sustainable funding. And so we need to figure out be the next two years to kind of taking the temperature of our communities and what would really sell that as you know we're quite tax averse uh and uh but we also have a billion dollars of identified creek work that needs to be done uh well, so so <clears throat> so if it sounds it sounds like there's an attempt to push the district towards the, the model that urban drainage now mile high flood district has in the Denver metropolitan area. Is that correct? We've been talking to them quite a bit. Yeah. How, how that's set up, how it works, it, you know, the, the dollars come in from a certain part in the county and then those dollars would go back and be spent in that particular part of the county. So, you know, Pueblo dollars wouldn't be spent in monument or things like that. Mm, okay. Okay. Um, just as a personal aside, I, I feel like I can say this now. I was at Matrix when I did my Fountain Creek work. So now, now I'm on the other side. And uh, I think that I felt then and feel very strongly now that 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 urban drainage flood control district MHFD uh, um, model would be is the way to go or a MAFCA in Albuquerque. A MAFCA is another similar, you know, metropolitan flood control authority, a MAFCA. Hmm. <clears throat> I think a MAFCA is very interesting. And you know, the hydrology of the Albuquerque area is, uh, I mean, Denver has a two, both are similar in, in terms of like the, the short duration, highly intense thunderstorms and stuff that are produced that wreak havoc. But um, um, the project that goes down to the mouth that Matrix is working on that includes the removal of those abutments, is that gonna tie in to the downstream end of the 13th Street project that just concluded? Not complete. No, it won't tie in completely. It won't. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Interesting. It's just in that lower section. Just in the lower section, and that there was some dredging there that was performed in 2017, as it kind of a ways in. back. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 And, and it all fell back in. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Darn sedimentation. <laughs> yeah, it's Fountain Creek. It uh, is. Yeah. Big challenges. Yeah. Anyhow, a final thought would be, um, I think folks should know. 
millions of dollars have been spent on Fountain Creek and the projects are absolutely impressive um, and methodologies that are really some real care and thought has gone into those projects, into the channel designs, into the sediment transport. I, I saw it on the design engineering side. So I would highly encourage the district to do as much as it can to spread the word on what's been done because those projects are very impressive. And if they can restore and stabilize and improve Fountain Creek, literally anything is possible. Everybody wins. Yeah. And part yeah, of the yeah. problem is a lot of those, you know, projects have been done on private property. So they're not visible and pretty and we don't do ribbon cuttings and things like that. So that's what we're looking at doing these next two years is we've got the aerial, you know, flyovers from Matrix and before and after pictures. So we just need to package it out pretty and let folks know, hey, this is what we've already done. What else is possible? Yeah, right. people like the, the Bar Farms project, you know, it was like two miles of channel length we brought in hundreds of trees yeah. <laughs> that were used as bank stabilization material. And yeah, I can tell it immense, uh, a lot of time went into the design of those banks. Um, the trees had, the tree trunks had to be a minimum diameter. They had to be a minimum length. Um, anyhow, yeah, people need to see that stuff because it's, it's pretty impressive. It's really cool. Allie, I, I think that you found your primary spokesperson when you kick off the campaign for that mill levy. <laughs> I think so. I know. I'm making a note. Dan Tucker, PR supervisor. Got it. On, on a serious note, it, it, it's great to be hearing this because I've I've had some some hands on touch and go in and out from time to time with with the public uh, engagement piece of the Fountain Creek watershed, and it's true. It, it, it's a almost overwhelming set of needs, especially with the particular geomorphology, but the work has been really, 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 really incredible. And so I, I think seriously, there's probably a role for all of us in, in getting that word out. It's certainly something that the, uh, the round table public education and outreach group can, can keep that as part of its message as well, even if it's not specifically been done with a lot of grants from from CWCB or something. So Great. all hands on deck. I'm expecting it. Thank you. <laughs> CJ, anything from you or even what you've seen as a grower out there um, on the east side of Pueblo with water and things like that? Any comments or thoughts or questions? Uh, no, nothing, nothing really. Good, but... um, it is nice to see because you know, it's nice to see that Fountain Creek has all of these projects going. And, you know, I, at the confluence, I, you know, I like to bike ride and ride in that area. And so I see all of the things that are happening. And a lot of times, you know, I have this, you know, jaded perspective, oh, it's going to rain, Fountain Creek's just going to flood us with mud, you know, because that's, it happens a lot. And it, you know, previously, before many projects were occurring, that's basically what happened. And then all of that sediment just kind of kept washing down the Arkansas as they as they merged. And so it's really actually very, you know, inspiring and very nice to hear that all of the projects are happening and things are actually being done to, to help. So, so that the people who are downstream, you know, that's all of our, our local farmers, all the farmers in Rocky Ford, you know, Otero as it goes down all the way down to Lamar are not having as many problems with their river water. So it's encouraging. Yeah, and, and that includes the the water quality issues with E. coli and everything yeah. else. It yeah. doesn't doesn't stop as soon as the fountain hits the Arkansas. Right. No, it just yeah helps there too. So, all right. So with that, um, both myself and Christy will kind of jump in on a couple topics here, and then we'll kind of wrap up with an open Q and A session. If anything, the rest of us kind of touch on, kind of spark some ideas or thoughts or comments, um, feel free to to jump in. And you're also welcome to jump in as we go through the rest of this material um, to, to kind of make comments as we go along. We really want this to be an open and moving discussion about what is important to you and um, any questions you might have about what we're doing. So with that, um, and I will share my screen as well so that you guys online uh, can see what we're looking at here is rainwater collection in Colorado is like one of the first things we're gonna talk about. So of course, as Ali kind of mentioned, um, that was illegal for a while. This is our handy dandy rainwater collection in Colorado fact sheet from CSU Extension. Um, for those of you online, if you're curious, um, you can always leave your email in the chat and I can make sure you get a copy of this. 
you'd like to look at it. But basically, it kind of goes over the history of why in the world was this not legal to begin with? What is it now? And uh, what are how do you even begin doing that? So if you don't know, um, before it was illegal to capture water that fell from the sky onto your own property and off your roof or your driveway or whatever the case was, because technically that water was already claimed. That was already someone else's water. So in the eyes of the law, you were a thief if you decided to collect that water. And the reasoning behind that was that once that water hits off your property and hits the ground, there's seepage, and then eventually it's gonna find its way through crevices and cracks in the soil into a river or a creek or a stream, and someone most likely has a claim on that, um, which is feeding the stream. So if you're keeping that water from that, then you're keeping it from the person who had that claim. Um, and that goes back to the law of prior appropriation, which is kind of first come, first serve. It goes back to the old West days where there were more people farming or ranching out here in the Western states than there are living in cities and making sure that water wasn't being wasted and diverted for random reasons. That water has to work. And so that's kind of where that reasoning was coming from. So with that, um, the House finally got some, some bills passed that actually allowed us to collect rainwater for anyone in Colorado. Um, and there's two specific ones. So the first one is House Bill 16, um, 16 1005, which is right here in this section. It kind of goes through it. But briefly, what it talks about is how in the world do you use this and what does it mean? So you can use it at a single family household or a multifamily household with four or four or fewer units. You can have a max of two rain barrels at each household. And then together, those two rain barrels um, can't hold more than 110 gallons. So that's with the two barrels together. And then as far as irrigation needs, that's a little about, it can do about 180 square feet, which is a bit smaller than a 15 by 15 foot small garden. If you're wondering what that 110 gallons could actually get you. And the way that this is um, done is that it's only captured from downspouts and it's used on the same property. It was captured on for outdoor purposes only, which is for lawns, gardens, things like that. You can't take it inside and use it to wash clothes or take a shower or flush your toilets or anything like that. I um, mean, it's definitely not safe to drink because if you're not very great at cleaning your gutters, um, I know I'm not, I need to get up there and do that. All that stuff off your roof is going right into that water um, and it's not healthy to drink. Um, as Ali talked about, sometimes we have things in our atmosphere, climate change is happening um, and we need to be careful about what we're drinking. So that's kind of why they don't want people just taking that into your house and drinking it straight from your roof. It's definitely not the cleanest thing in the world. And then the other part of that is this section here, which is the SB0980. Um, and this is for rural residents with exempt um, wells and you can actually get a permit with, for this from the Colorado Division of Water Resources. So what this is, is you can collect rainwater um, with, a, with a permit. Same thing um, with the barrels, things like that. There's no barrel size limit and you still have to abide by that 110 gallons. And it's gotta be collected from the roof of the primary residence on that property. But the nice thing is, is then you can actually use it for different things, whether that's for outdoor use with your lawn garden, you can use it for agriculture purposes, such as farming, your watering livestock, whatever the case is. And then you can also bring it indoors as well, as long as you get it treated and you're checking on the quality of the water, um, which is nice. But all of those specifications have to be listed in the permit. You can't pick and choose. So if TJ decides to do this on his property and decides he's gonna say it's for farming, but then he decides to go give it to his wife for maybe some clothes washing, Technically, he can't do that because that's not what's listed in the permit. So there is some um, legalities you'd want to be careful about uh, with that. And the rest of it kind of talks about everything else you want to think about when you're collecting water, which is like concerns about um, mosquitoes, HOAs. If you live in one, you know, can they ban you from having one? Technically, no, they cannot ban you from having it as it is illegal right now um, to collect water. And then just a couple other questions um, and some references and resources. The other nice thing about this is that our office is actually planning a rain barrel class for the month of June, where if you come and pay for the event, um, you'll actually get to build your own rain barrel, learn how to use it, make sure it's set up properly, and then take it home that day and set it up at your home and make sure it's ready to go for the next rainstorm we get, or possibly snow, since that seems to be um, the way our weather's going this year. So it'll collect whatever precipitation we get. Um, so definitely, if you're interested, you can contact our office and we can make sure you get the details for that. And uh, we're pretty excited about that. So that's kind of the whole spiel about rain barrels. And I know sometimes that can be confusing. Are there any other questions or issues regarding that before we move on? 
No? Okay. Um, one of the bigger questions we sometimes get with that, especially for our office, is can you use it as a gravity fed system to water chickens? Yes, you can. So if you have chickens, things like that, and you're looking for a way to maybe set stuff up on a self-use system without getting super into technology, you can usually do a gravity fed system off a rain barrel that will keep animals um, drinking. Obviously for larger livestock, it won't sustain them enough. So you would have to supplement, but for the small ones like rabbits, chickens, things like that, you could get away with it. Um, as long as you're watching that water level and making sure that there's continuous water for them, especially as we get into the hotter months. And then the next couple things are just like, we also partner with like the NRCS and the USDA. Both of them have great resources, grants and funding for farmers and ranchers to kind of get some help with infrastructure building. Um, for example, like the NRCS has the EQIP grant, which is the Environment Quality Incentives Program, which is a voluntary conservation program that helps ag producers in a manner that promotes ag production and environmental quality as compatible goals, which fits in with the farm bill where that 10% um, of national mandatory program funding was targeted towards water protection. So for example, TJ, if you applied, you would be able to get funds for that, especially if you needed help modernizing um, or even just ma maintaining what you have on your property, you could actually get some funds for that um, because they do believe that is that is something they want, they want to help you with. So they'll actually give you money for that program. Same thing with the USDA. They have a lot of different opportunities depending on what you're growing, what your operation is, what fits best for what you're doing. Um, but the really good one they have is the USDA Rural Development Loan and Grant Program, um, which is where they really look to build that infrastructure development is what they look to do, especially in rural areas where you just don't have the help basically. Um, and unfortunately, maybe you're a little bit behind some of the inner city workings, but you're just as important sometimes even more than what's happening in the city. Um, so they really look at to, to help with a lot of that infrastructure stuff that can get really costly really quickly and is most of the time not something you can DIY. So that's a, a great program that they also offer too, just nationally, but a lot of farmers here in Colorado take advantage of it as well. So just a little heads up if you're interested and maybe look into maybe replace a couple of things. There's, there's some funding we can get you. Um, and Beth? Uh, this is Paul. I, I know at the Ag Summit that you all put on, uh, there was a seminar there about these programs, and they said that it's kind of frustrating because there's a lot more availability than is being taken advantage of, and they have a hard time getting the word out to, to, to very, very busy people who are out there working on the land, don't have time to think about grants and things. So I really appreciate you mentioning that and, and your, your extension program, sending that, sending that message out and getting more people involved. Absolutely. Yeah, that's that is a great point, Paul. Um, we know the CDA and the NRCS sometimes have a hard time reaching people like like TJ, who kindly took a moment to, to come to these um, events. But it is hard, which is why we try to record these things, things like that. So if you're sitting on the track here, maybe you're a little bored, but you're like, you know, I'm curious about water grant funding. You can watch this fun little recorded session and hear from um, some great people here in this room and, and learn about what opportunities you can maybe either Google or call the extension office you know, contact um, you guys at the Watershed District and, and get some answers. Hopefully that will benefit their operation. And of course, people like TJ going out and spreading and maybe if he's here in Whispers, maybe put a little fillers out for, for some of us to, to continue to help our community. Um, and with that, we kind of have, um, Ali kind of touched on it as well as that the Pueblo Water, Paul, you might have even been part of it, has put out their water system booklet, if you're ever curious about it, where it just talks about a lot of what Ali talked about in her presentation, like that our water originates in the Rocky Mountains above Leadville, which eventually flows into the Arkansas River. You all saw that on her presentation um, with the pipeline. And then from there, it's diverted from the river to the Whitlock treatment plant. Um, to intake centers like the Pueblo Dam or from the Northside River intake downstream of the dam, um, which kind of takes out that non-point point pollution that she talked about and referenced in her, her PowerPoint. Um, and they take the raw water, clean it up, it goes in the storage tanks and pump stations for the rest of the city. So um, very important work they do. Allie covered it way more in detail. Um, and I'm sure most of you are probably familiar with that. And the other part is if you're ever curious in that, um, reclamation facility, they do actually offer tours for anybody. It's really cool. It does take about an hour, um, but they do offer tours to anyone who wants to come see it, kind of see what they're about and see what it's like. And that does run 24 hours, seven days a week. So um, they're pretty flexible with tours. You're welcome to go check it out if you're curious and wanting to make sure it's been been doing right. Maybe you're seeing something downstream. Great place to start because they might know what in the world is going on. So um, it's it's a really helpful tool that we can we can actually have access to. Not every county is like that, um, and we're we're very fortunate here. 
with that, um, kind of wanted to talk about last couple things here that we're doing is um, just like the Prairie Smart Watering for Pueblo West. If any of you've been out there, you know it's dry and it's really, really windy all the time because we have zero trees. Um, we have shrubs, which don't technically count and really tall cactuses. So the wind just whips through like you wouldn't believe. So we have different tips for watering out there than what you would do here in the inner city of Pueblo or even out on the Mesa out in Avondale just because the city blocks a little bit of that wind, kind of breaks it up and it's not saying it's not as impactful, but it's a little less than what sometimes you're, they're getting out there in Pueblo West. So with that, they have some tips like watering before 8 a.m. or before or after 7 to reduce the water loss from evaporation and wind. You, if you do that, you can actually reduce it by 90%. So that's a huge amount if you just change the watering times on your sprinkler systems. And then in that June to August time, they actually did some measurements showing you need about 1.25 to about one inch of water per watering cycle and that you want to water about two to three days out of a week. So not even that often, especially for concerned about water uh, restrictions, limitations, things like that that affect our city and our farmers. Um, there's ways to get around it and still you know, get water out there for plants and lawns and things like that. Obviously, Allie talked about, you know, check your systems, look for leaks, over sprays, things like that, and then do the cycle and soak method, which I will pull that up so you all can kind of see what that looks like. Um, I got to find the right one because I have, I have a lot of tabs open because um, I was so excited. I was a lot like Allie. I was so excited. I had so many things to show you all um, and just couldn't wait to, to show it all. So, and if I can't find it, I will make sure that anyone who's interested has um, access to copies. I can't find it, that's all right. Um, so then the next part of that is just that CSU Extension is doing a couple things pretty soon that's exciting regarding WaterWise and xeriscaping. So next weekend, we are doing our WaterWise self-guided uh, garden tour. It's a free one day thing. So it's next weekend, June 4th on that Saturday uh, from 9 a.m. to 3. And the Colorado Master Gardeners will be present to answer any questions you have about each garden, the, bio, the biographies of each area, and the plant list. So you can scan it here um, on our little QR code for the maps and locations. It's totally self-done. So it's all on your own. It's free to the public. We highly encourage everyone to come see it. And then we also have lots of lovely handouts about how to design your own landscapes in your yard, what's best for our area, specifically for wildflowers, like Allie touched on grasses, trees, everything, um, everything that grows and kind of gives it a little bit of cover for erosion. Um, we have it. So if you're ever interested in that, some fact sheets and landscape designs, we definitely, we got you covered here in the CSU Extension Office. Um, before we switch to Christy, is there questions? Yes, comments? quick question, please, Beth. Uh, on the WaterWise Garden Tours, will that, since it's just one day, will that include both Pueblo and Pueblo West locations? I believe it does, yes. Okay, I didn't know if that was Pueblo West exclusive or not. Yeah, there is um, inner city ones and then out in Pueblo West as well. So it's wherever you're comfortable traveling to. Um, so you can kind of set it up yourself, especially if you live out in Pueblo West and maybe you want to come in down and see some gardens, get a bite to eat, maybe walk walk around the river walk um, and then, you know, see some more gardens. It's a it's a great tour to set up however you want and see some really cool areas of Pueblo. So it's a neat thank day. you. Yeah. I have a question. Yeah. Um, I don't know if you how in-depth you got to, to researching the wastewater treatment facility, but did they did you find anywhere where they mentioned like how many gallons of water they reclaimed? How much do they put back into the city? How yes, um, and that was actually in Paul. Well, I'm not sure if you were part of the book that I kind of stumbled upon that had some great information. Let's see if I can. Yeah, yeah. If that's the Pueblo Water Book, it's the one that just it really looks at the drinking water side rather than the wastewater side. So it, it just talks about the actual, you know, the get, getting the water into the system and getting used. And then when it goes, either percolates back down through the, through the, through the ground and gets into the, back into the river, or some of it goes through the stormwater system and goes, and that that goes through stormwater does end up going to the wastewater treatment plant. But the, you'd have to get those figures uh, from, from Pueblo, from the city of Pueblo wastewater department. They have those figures on, what the volumes that they treat are and what the constitu constituents are that they remove from the water. And they, they've got a lot of really good uh, information on that. And I know that they do tours at the wastewater treatment plant as well. So they uh, they don't smell very good, but they're very educational. Yes. Dan, does that return flow? So if, if the wastewater treatment plant 
you know, sends water back into the system for, for folks in the city to use. Does that return flow hurt your projects at all? Does that, does it make a difference? Is it not enough to really tell how much water is getting put back into the river or put back into the reservoir to be used for your storage, for your group's storage stuff? Or is that kind of off point? If I understand your question correctly, um, um, like municipal wastewater return flows are a huge component of what we rely on as augmentation sources. Sure. Um, uh, El Paso County, <clears throat> we don't we don't get a lot from Colorado Springs Utilities uh, or Pueblo Water in terms of uh, municipal return flows, but a lot of the smaller municipalities up Fountain Creek, a lot of the water that constitutes Fountain Creek's base flow um, is water that we claim credit for under short and long-term leases and then use against monthly and lagged well pumping depletions and exchange into storage. Um, so it's a, it's a critical component of our supplies. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you for that. Mm -hmm. And of course, you can't get too far into that conversation without getting really wrapped up into Colorado water law. Uh, yeah, no, that's did, we, and I'll speak to Pueblo's situation. Colorado Springs has a, a similar situation, although their percentages of native and non-native water are pretty different than Pueblo's. But so any of the native water, native to the Arkansas Basin that Pueblo water uses in its system, any of those return flows go back into the river to be used downstream. So it's a use it once and then pass it on. But any of the water that is that is come into the basin from a Trans Mountain source can be used to extinction. So that's measured and whatever does get released at the wastewater treatment plant of that Trans Mountain water, uh, Pueblo can hold back that much water in Pueblo Reservoir, it's called an exchange. And so then they can reuse that water. And so those water rights don't really benefit um, agriculture or the, or, the, or the other communities downstream, whereas the native Arkansas River water rights do. There again, Colorado water law is really, really complicated and sometimes doesn't seem to make any rational sense, but uh, that, that contributes to the, uh, to the, you know, measuring the amounts that, that are going to be usable by, by downstream users from, from a municipal supplier. I would, I would say as an addendum onto that, that from the standpoint of agricultural use, they're not directly used in the same way that surface rights would be, you know, at one of the main ditch or canal diversions, but there, I mean, they're, <clears throat> those flows, those fully consumable flows that you're describing are completely critical to uh, annual replacement plans on the river. Um, they, they're what keep any junior water right being exercised via a well solvent outside of some sort of changed, you know, I, I could cite uh, some examples under the Catlin, for example, where those folks have added augment, they went through a change of use case, added augmentation to their water rights, kept irrigation as an existing use and they're pumping wells for irrigation and then taking their Catlin shares through aug stations and then counting those against their well pumping. Um, but aside from that, aside from native instances like that, 68,000 acres are irrigated by, by wells that are in AGRA's Rule 14 annual Arkansas River replacement plan. Those fully consumable sources that keep those plans whole those people wouldn't be pumping if we couldn't provide them that water. So it's kind of a, it's an unfor, I, it's an unseen component to those, those fully consumable waters that you're talking about that are absolutely critical. And I'm <clears throat> speaking as the engineer for Agra looking forward 20 years, I'm highly worried about the disappearance of those return flows, particularly in Colorado, in the Colorado Springs metropolitan area through, uh, through things like direct potable reuse. You know that 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 could stand to dry us up on Fountain Creek. Uh, you know, a, a basin-wide implementation of direct potable reuse or aquifer storage and recovery. Triview Metropolitan District currently has a grant to investigate ASR up in the northern part of El Paso County. There's another component that, yeah, it's really critical. I think uh, I think ag folks would do well to know just where they stand when with regard to those return flows. Thank you. For Great that. points. Yeah. Any 
anything else before we switch to Chrissy and then kind of wrap up? I'll keep mine brief. <laughs> <laughs> I think most of you all know about uh, irrigation and the types of irrigating that there is. Um, so I just wanted to kind of pop through an overview of the types of irrigation there are, the pros and cons to each, um, and kind of how to how to be a little bit more efficient with our agricultural water use. I it probably is going to be hard to see, but um, the USDA collaborated with Colorado State University to put together a small acreage irrigation guide, and this has got a really it's a really great resource. It's got a lot of um, information on how to make irrigation more efficient, um, why you need to make it more efficient. It's got some great um, calculation examples to kind of determine what plants actually need using evapotranspiration rates and those kinds of things, uh, just to actually be more efficient in our water use. Um, put out, I think, in 2019, so it's definitely relevant, I would say, uh, to, our, to our water use. Um, but there's, in general, basically four or five or so forms of irrigation for agriculture, um, speaking large scale more than backyard home gardener. Home gardener is probably gonna use a hose and you know tiny sprinkler irrigation system. Uh, but the least efficient type of irrigation is flood irrigation, right? Where you're just putting as much water as you can onto an open field, uh, literally flooding it. Uh, and unfortunately that's, not a lot of water gets used. Um, leaching occurs, so it gets, that water goes past the root zone. Obviously, a plant's not going to use it past the root zone. Uh, a lot of it runs off. A lot of it, you know, evaporates, and so it's an unfortunate, very inefficient way. But it's super easy to do. You don't have to have minimal labor, um, minimal equipment, all of that kind of thing. And so the next thing is that flood air or the furrow irrigation, which is kind of like flood irrigation, except you're just sending water down a furrow, which is what we see a lot of our farmers doing in this area. It works for this area because we have water coming down the ditch, which is thank goodness we, we still have that. Um, it's about 30 to 40 percent efficient water efficient, so water still getting past the root zone, still draining off. Um, and then there's the slightly more efficient types of irrigation, which is sprinkler irrigation and drip irrigation. Sprinkler literally uses giant sprinkler systems to spray water across the top of, um, of the farm fields or the crops. Thanks, there it is. Yep. Uh, and so this, that kind of irrigation they are saying is probably somewhere around 60% efficient, um, meaning water gets to the root zone a little bit better or stays in the root zone a little bit better. Um, but there is on really windy days, and especially this past spring, we've been having extreme wind events. Uh, it's not quite as efficient due to wind blowing all that sprinkler irrigation off and evaporating it. Um, and then drip irrigation, which is the most labor intensive. It's, there's a technical curve to have to learn about how to do it. It requires pumps, so more electricity and all of these things. A lot of times folks have to use um, well water or whatever. There's some, they need some sort of filter to put into it. So it's a lot more intensive, a lot more involved, um, but it does provide 80% efficiency, meaning that uh, plants are gonna get the most bang for their buck. Um, but really when you're doing, when you're, when you're talking about water efficiency, especially irrigating, you wanna just, you wanna do what works for you, right? So it can be a combination of using an efficient, you know, watering system and using, you know, planting a certain type of crop. And that's the thing that, you know, it's good to, to think about what, how much water do my plants actually need? Um, oftentimes we're seeing, you know, we're just watering when we have the water because that's, we've got the water, so we might as well put it on, might as well irrigate, uh, but plants might not need all of that water. Here they probably do because it gets really hot and dry. So, so our plants require, you know, I think vegetables in general in our area require somewhere between 20 to really 20 to 30 inches of precipitation to make a successful crop throughout the growing season. So they need quite a bit of water um, to really actually make it work. So, but, but if we were, if you were getting down to the nitty gritty and maybe on the small acreage management section, this, this might work if you look and see how much water your plant is actually needing using evapotranspiration rates. Um, those are usually given in like inches per acre uh, 
that'll definitely help you determine, oh, do I need to irrigate? Nope, then don't do it. You know, you're saving water by not putting water on, on those plants or those crops. Um, this has been mentioned a lot of times, but maintenance your irrigation system. So making sure that there aren't leaks, especially in like the sprinkler and the drip systems, leaks could cause an excessive amount of water loss, unnecessary water loss. So making sure leaks are um, maintained, those systems are maintained, leaks are mitigated for, um, and that kind of stuff. And, uh, and uh, other things that you could do. So a, a lot of our, especially our ditches out here are, are dirt ditches, open open ditches, um, using the polyacrylamide chemical that can help to, or some sort of straw mulch that can help to um, keep that water in the ditch, not infiltrate or out of that ditch as much and keep it in the ground where your plants actually need it. And so um, that, I, like I said, that's, I just wanna do a quick brief overview. Um, but the biggest take home is really kind of just, you kind of have to figure out what works for you if you have the time and you have the the technicality, you know, try and use that more, maybe more a little bit more efficient watering system. Um, if not, you know, maybe do some other things that help you mitigate for water efficiency, like not watering, not irrigating when you don't need to, or um, using some cover on the ground to keep evapotranspiration from not happening, not occurring quite as intensely, especially in our very hot, uh, especially during our very hot summer. So. Um, but other than that, if anybody has any questions, feel free to, to ask, but I just wanted to keep it brief for you and get going. So then TJ, I'm going to pick on you a little bit. So with you farming, and I know you've, you've done that for a while now. So what have you seen with your farm? Have you changed things to try and make it more efficient or just haven't been able to get there? What are you seeing out there? As well, a I always wonder about the 30 to 40 percent efficiency in furrow irrigation because there's got to be a pretty big range depending on how you're Absolutely. irrigating. Oh, yeah. Uh, you know, we do things like surging um, where you're you're setting water and then setting a different set of rows and then coming back here to try and be more efficient. You know, the, uh, like of the th so if you're 30 to 40 percent efficient, that means you're whatever 60 to 70 percent inefficient. So how much of that is figured as runoff? So if you can have less runoff off the end of the field, right. then you're you're increasing that efficiency. So I, you know, I think we're trying to be pretty efficient. I so think I, that's I'm one of curious. the best things you can do with furrow irrigation is not let it run off your yeah. field. If you're yeah. keeping it all on your field, I mean, a giant field is going to absorb that water. Right. So as you long still as have it's not going off. The field. You still have the evaporation. Yeah. Point. I mean, you still that, maybe but. maybe have some leaching, but I. I think the way we're irrigating, we're we're probably not getting a whole lot of leaching below the root zone. So if the if the inefficiency is that we can control is runoff, that's the great way to do it. Then you know, I, I think we can we can do okay. But, when we put, when we put together uh, our Rule 14 replacement plan and we allocate well pumping water to a sole source. A sole source well for surface irrigation, the wellhead depletion factor is 0.36, meaning that whatever <clears throat> whatever they need, whatever that crop irrigation requirement is, divide that point, 0.36, and that's the number the number on the the right hand side resulting from that mathematical operation is the allocation that they would get uh, for the year under our plan. So that's it's a huge amount of water. By contrast, if they've got uh, drip, if it's somebody out under the Bessemer who um, is irrigating by a drip system, the wellhead depletion factor is one. So they get they get exactly what they need to wow. match the crop irrigation requirement in their fields. Those are huge differences. Yeah. So that so what you're saying is that you are using 36 percent efficiency for for irrigation. That's exactly right. Yeah, that the, that the consumptive use, the consumptive use fraction of each unit of water delivered is 36%. Alternatively, when we allocate water to a well user for like a center pivot system, the wellhead depletion factor is 0.75. A supplemental well for surface irrigation is 0.5. Uh, and drip is one. The wellhead depletion factor is one. So not perfectly efficient in reality, but 
the the mathematical presumption and the accepted wellhead depletion factors uh, that are that are administered under Rule 14 by the state engineer's office is is you know they assume 100% efficiency in drip. Any other last comments, questions, thoughts from from anybody to anybody? This is an open open floor, open floor now. Yeah, I just will echo Paul in thanking you for uh, offering these and allowing that conversation to happen. I think you know whether it's one person or a full room of of people, there's always information that can be shared and more awareness gained. So I really uh, see the value in this. So thanks for taking that on. Absolutely. Thanks. For joining us. Yeah. So for the, the grants and loan grants you talked about, who is who is our context for NRCS? Lana. Lana, even though she's in Fowler, she's still she's here. Just, she's, yeah, she's for public. Yeah, she does oversee. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah. And yeah. for the USDA stuff, is that the, the US... FSA office? You can use the FSA, but um, there's also a couple of people I work with directly that I can get you in contact with for the USDA that okay. kind of handle those specifically. So yeah. um, I can, I'll email, I'll email McCall and she'll share it with you. I think me. Diana also does equip. Yeah, right, that's the, NRCS. Okay. Yeah, that's oh, the NRCS. Oh, yeah, the USDA does that role. Yeah. Other one. Yes. Sorry. Yeah. yeah, I can get you that. that cool. Cool. Yeah. Um, I think most of the sign up for equip is in the fall right it's like for no, next so year and i yeah. think they they did have money but they like the state like chopped their funds and so not everybody i think got what they wanted and if you're watching this as a recorded session um we had said that lana pearson is our nrcs person who oversees um Pueblo county along with carl beeman so we will um if you have questions about that or want to contact them um you know you can easily find their contact info on the nrcs website or you can call the extension office and talk with myself or christy and we can uh, get you that contact info if anyone ever needs it same with the usca um we partner with them quite a bit on everything and we appreciate it so thank you all for joining um and hopefully you'll join us next time so be on the lookout and like us on facebook so you can make sure to keep in touch with us and have a great evening thanks thank Allie. You. thanks everybody have a great weekend. Thanks. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks for watching this recorded session of the second Water Roundtable discussion. Be sure to contact us if you'd like further information regarding any of the items we touched on in this video, and let us know how we can help you. All CSU Extension programs are available to everyone without discrimination.